Hello everybody, Sir Vertigo here, your friendly lore knight. This video is going to be the first in a set of foundation videos that will let me explain the Galarian universe better, and just overall more clearly. So today, we're getting metaphysical and discussing the solar system of Galarian, and what each planet in the Galarian solar system looks like. If there's enough attention and won't, I will gladly make videos dwelling into each planet in much greater detail, maybe as a part of my 5 minute video series for some of the smaller of the planets. I really hope you guys enjoy this video, and I hope you settle in and watch it through, because Octurn, the final planet in the Galarian solar system, is easily the most interesting of all of the planets. The material plane of the Galarian universe is much like our own universe, ever expanding with laws of gravity, thermodynamics, a fixed speed of light. You have infinite galaxies containing countless stars with planets circling some of these stars, much like our own Milky Way. As a bonus fact, Earth and the Milky Way are actually in Pathfinder, separated by countless miles of empty space between our galaxy and Galarians, although in the Galarian world, our planet is known as Jasun, but we will get into how Earth is known by Galarians in a later video. Galarian's solar system holds 11 planets, all radiating outward from the Sun. Closest to the Sun is Avalon the Horse, followed by Castroville the Green, and Galarian the Cage. Avalon is known as the Horse due to its short 90-day orbit and its appearance to race across the night sky. Avalon is one-third of the diameter of Galarian and made of dense iron and heavy metals. Through the use of telescope and divinciation magic, strange mechanical ruins can be seen across its surface, along with thousands of meteor craters. Due to its proximity to the sun and its lack of an atmosphere, the planet fluctuates extremely in its surface temperatures. During the day, it's hot enough to melt lead at nearly 800 degrees, and at night, it reaches super freezing colds of negative 300 degrees. Despite this, at times with magical aids, movement can be seen across its surface, in the form of mechanical creations left behind by an ancient race known as the First Ones centuries ago. Without masters to serve, these mechanical beings have expanded without purpose, and they now take on any form imaginable, from large hulking tank-like creatures to small floating jellyfish-like creatures. Castravel is the closest planet to Galarian, and covered in teeming jungles, endless swamps, and strange clouds of colored gas. Trees stretch hundreds of feet into the air, with branches large enough to support entire houses, or clutter in so tight that next to no light can reach the primeval swamps that litter the planet's surface. With such a variety of life upon Castroville, it's no wonder the planet is often associated with lust and fertility. Indeed, the Lashunta women are some of the most beautiful women in the entire solar system, with tall, lithe forms similar to perfect specimens of humans or elven females, save for the small antenna that rise from their forehead. But, the women are not merely objects of lust. They are educated, civilized, and fiercely matriarchal. They guard their cities loyally, abroad massive lizard steeds forcing the forest back from their city's edges. Strangely enough, Castroville is also home to the Elves, and even they aren't sure if they originated from Castroville and navigated to Galarian, or from Galarian to Castroville. While many Elves do live on Galarian, their homeland, the Nation of Sovereign, can be found on Castroville, and this is where the Elves fled to to take refuge during the Earthfall. Ratfolk can also be found on Castroville. Castroville and Galarian have the most amount of portals between the worlds, and as such, they have the closest relationship between all of the planets. Galarian is the third planet, and the setting of Pathfinder. After this video, we will do a Galarian video where we discuss the planet as a whole, and its nations, and its cities, but here is a fast summary. It holds eight continents across its surface with much of the Pathfinder setting taking place amongst Avistan and Garund. Outside of these continents, we also have Arcadia, the ruins of Aslant, 
The Crown of the World, Casmeron, Sarasun, and Tian Sha. It has five great oceans and nine seas across its surface. Past Galarian, we have Akaton the Red versus the Lion and Eox the Dead. Akaton is the fourth planet from the sun. While its surface is red, Agaton is both colder and harsher than Galarian. Long ago, Agaton was covered in vast seas rich with life, yet due to a thin atmosphere it has long since evaporated, leaving vast plains of iron-rich sand and stone that cover the planet now. Much like its unforgiving landscape, its inhabitants are equally unforgiving. While the planet does host a significant population of red-skinned humanoids that are exceptionally similar to Galarian humans, with the ability to interbreed with Galarian humans, they are hardly what people think of when they think of Akaton. Instead, you most likely picture the Shabhuts, 12-foot-tall gray-skinned warriors with four arms, each muscular limb capable of bearing sword, lance, or long rifle. They share this world with the rat folk and the lizard folk, all mostly humanoid beings. But outside this, there are also the contemplatives of Ashok, which are strange floating brains with small vestigial bodies hanging beneath them. A doorway between these worlds can be found in the Mwangi Expanse and is known as the Doorway to the Red Star. Ursaz the Line is the fifth planet in the solar system and is tidally locked with a single side of the planet always facing the sun. Due to this, one side of the planet is a blistering desert and the other a frozen wasteland. Due to this strange imbalance, the only inhabitable portion of the planet is the so-called Terminator Line, for which the planet is nicknamed, where day meets night at the edge of the planet. Versez is mainly inhabited by the Versatites, eight-foot-tall humanoids with delicate elven-type features and legs that seem just a tad too long. Their eyes protrude out of their skulls a bit, similar to a mouse, and their skin is able to change color at will to alleviate radiation as they travel from the dark side to the full bright of the planet. The Versatites prefer to only wear as much clothing as needed, preferring to decorate their skin with brilliant patterns instead of relying on sewn fabrics and dyed leathers. The Diaspora, or the Lost Ones, as some Galarians remember them, is a massive meteor belt that sits between Versus and Eox. Ancient Aslanti scholars reference two more planets in the solar system that used to sit between the planets Versus and Ox, by the name of Damiar and Lovo, or the Twins as they were more commonly called. The Twins were believed to be the first sentient race to achieve interstellar planet uh, spaceflight, and had formed a powerful partnership between Damier and Lovo, and they began sending emissaries to the other worlds in the system. Then, just as suddenly, they were gone. Aslanti scholars tell of a day when the twins appeared to flare into a single bright light, bright enough to turn the night to day, and then they were gone. In its place, an expanding field of debris that stretched across the vast voids of space bombarding neighboring planetoids with meteorites at random. In the year since, the belt has stabilized and sits now as a vast ring of meteors between Versus and Eox, but due to samples of the various meteors that take up the vast range of space, it is believed that this meteor belt is the origin of the Starstone, or at least the fragment that Aerodin recovered and brought to the surface in current day Absalom. The sixth planet, Eox the Dead was once a lush and vibrant world, with large forests and fertile golden seas. The primary inhabitants of Eox were translucently pale-skinned humans with slightly larger craniums, a physical mark of their superior intelligence. Other than this, they were so astoundingly similar to Galarian humans that it's theorized they were either long-lost cousins to modern humans or possibly the origin the origin race of Galarian humans. In the end, though, their high intelligence was the Eoxans' downfall. As a race, the Eoxans turned bitter and petty, obsessed with discovering more and more, abandoning concerns such as love and morality. The theory goes that Eoxans fired an interplanetary weapon so powerful that its backlash boiled the atmosphere. 
burning all the life-sustaining gases in a planet-wide firestorm. Cities burned and the oceans boiled. Most residents of the planet were killed instantly, but a lucky few thousands survived in self-contained environments and secure bunkers. These few survivors turned to undeath, and the remaining Eoxans all embraced a form of lichdom that has kept them in a permanent but sterile state of undeath. Unable to grow their population any further, but unconcerned by such petty distractions as eating and breathing, they now sweep through the cosmos as the undead Bone Sages. Past Eox, we have Triaxis the Wanderer, Liavra the Dreamer, and Brethida the Cradle. With a solar orbit every 317 years and a heavily eccentric orbit, Triaxis the Wanderer can be best described as a dual planet. At its furthest orbit, the planet is so far from the sun that it's a pale dot in the sky, and the land is packed ice and tundras across its entire surface. At its closest, it is closer to the sun than even Castrovel, and its surface thaws and mass jungles and green spring up across the planet, leaving about 157 years in a distinct summer and winter climate. The humanoids of Triaxis are separated by generations, known as the Winterborn and Summerborn. During the winter, the planet is covered in glaciers and snowfields, and the Triaxians take refuge in castles and towns carved from ice and stone, hunting giant furred insects and snowbirds, while burning fungi and a snow moss for warmth. The seas freeze over and narrow straits become massive land bridges that connect its many islands and isthmuses. The Triaxians have evolved to have bodies that change with the orbit. Winterborn will sport thick winter white coats with narrow elongated eyes to protect from snow blindness. During the summer, the ice and snow melt, watering massive jungles and plains that quickly give way to jungles that rival the Mwangi and fertile fields. During the summer decades, the Summerborn attempt to put back as much crop and food as possible to feed the future generations during the winter years. The Avra, the Dreamer, the eighth planet, is a part of a pair of gas giants in the farthest Galarian solar system, so massive that its moons are as large as some of the other planets. Unlike most planets, Liavra forgoes the firm surface of rock and metal for thick expanses of gas thick enough for other planets to disappear into. Despite the lack of a surface, it is not without its own native inhabitants. Strange creatures, unlike most terrestrial animals, dip and dive through this gas field, feeding on floating plants and giant bacteria that make up the planet's meager food chain. These creatures can take on dozens of forms, from bird-like flyers to great floating clouds that glide through the sky via some form of jet propulsion. Out of the solar system, Liavra is one of the most dangerous for your average terrestrial explorer for two main reasons. With a complete lack of breathable atmosphere and a lack of ground as terrestrials understand it. Instead, this planet functions like a massive ocean, with gas pressure increasing as you travel closer to the planet's core, until the pressure is so massive that you find yourself either crushed or burnt to death by the intense heat of the planet's core. The planet is so dense with magical ley lines that the Brethidans, from the nearby planet Brethida, are lulled into a meditative trance by them. Their trance is so strong that the colonists never reported back to Brethida after arriving, and those who attempt to waken them face the Dreamer's violent fury. Brethida, the nearby and equally large gas planet, is the sister pair to Liavra. Like Liavra, it lacks a solid, solid foundation consisting solely of swirling gas clouds throughout. The Brethidans, more of a family classification than a specific species, float through the planet, with the intelligent ones banding together to create a far-reaching and highly advanced society, albeit bereft of human thought and conventional technology. The Brethidans have a form of localized hive mind, creating new and unique combinations of personality, memories, and intelligence as they pass each other in the gas giant slipstreams. As a result, much of the planet has a communal, gentle society. 
It's known as the Cradle due to the fact that most of the native Brethidans have explored the multitude of planet-sized moons, captured in Brethida's gravity, and populated them. And finally, out past Brethida, we have two anomalies in the system, Opaste the Messenger and Octurn the Stranger. Opaste the Messenger is a strange planetoid that immediately sets itself aside as a solar anomaly just by the strange orbit it takes. Its angle is nearly perpendicular to Galarian's own orbit and this leads to the theory that the object appears to have been drawn into the sun's gravity by some other force. From its barren appearance, it appears to just be another asteroid, but several things on its surface lends it a mystery that sets it apart. A series of arches can be found on Opaste's surface, with one set further away and inactive. These arches match the markings of various portals across Galarian that facilitate travel between these different planets, save the one arch that sits by itself. This arch has markings that are currently unknown, and it's theorized that this lone arch is connected to a distant universe where the object originated from. You see, Opaste is not a rogue asteroid at all, but a spaceship containing the ancient Lee race. The race is centuries old, old enough that they've long forgotten how they came to be in the Galarian solar system or why they came. But here they remain, trapped inside the metal blast doors that make up the only entrance into the ship. Deities and even teleportation magic find it very difficult to get inside the ship. Octurn is the final planet in the system and the most mysterious. Its distance makes it nearly impossible for all but the strongest of mages to reach, and it has no portals upon Galarian's surface. Some say Octurn is a world of monsters, or the home of an ancient god waking from a million year slumber, or perhaps it does not fully exist in just our plane of existence. Whatever the case, observance of the planet has been strange and nearly completely unreliable. All observers report different descriptions, from a terrestrial world with no obvious, obvious atmosphere, to a ringed gas giant with no surface, to a dark, dead, and lifeless hunk of rock, even when viewed through the same shared telescope at the same time. Though with roughly twice the diameter of Galarian, the planet seems to have no set diameter, shifting by a slight but significant margin at regular intervals. Combined with the fact that the few who have managed to set foot upon the planet have discovered that drilling down far enough into the soil will strike veins of black, acidic musk, this leads to one chilling conclusion. Octurn is in fact one enormous, slowly breathing entity, a blind planet-sized god being of unknown intellect and motive. How long it's been in the Galarian system and what it will do if it ever wakes up is completely unknown. The Galarian system is fascinating, and there's a lot more information in the Distant World sourcebook full of adventures and locations on each planet that add a lot to any interstellar campaign. But this is a quick and dirty look at the solar system, and from here, I have a few announcements. After this video, we will be covering Galarian as a whole, with an overview of the nations and land borders then shifting into an overview of major events in its history before moving into the planes of existence and demi-planes. From there, I'll be covering the races of 2nd edition and the deities, starting with the Inner Sea Pantheon, but I will be moving my way to Dwarven, Elven, Dragon, and any other pantheons in due time. If you would like to see a certain god or goddess covered sooner rather than later, drop it in the comments and it'll add a little weight to my covering of that specific topic. Each comment greatly helps me guide this channel, and it lets me know that someone out there likes it enough to take a moment and drop a comment. I will be resuming my weekly upload schedule. I was dealing with a recent case of bronchitis that pretty much stole my voice, and I was waiting for some new PC equipment to arrive. So. I've just not had time to record lately. I now have a blue snowball mic and mic stand, so hopefully my audio will be a bit crisper and won't vary as much between my videos, but I am spending my time watching other YouTubers and trying to learn all I can about improving my audio quality. If you have any tips or suggestions for me, please feel free to send me a message either here or on my Discord, which you'll find down in the comments. 
I know a few people here have given me tips about stumbling over my words, but at the moment at least, I do record in my living room late at night when my two daughters are asleep. So late nights after work tend to lead to a sluggish mind. So for now, until I can come up with a better way to record, you're going to have to kind of give me a pass on that. I appreciate the encouraging comments I've received so far though. In a little over a month, I've made it to just under 500 subscribers, and I can't wait to see those numbers start climbing again. But enough blabbing from me. I hope you enjoyed, guys. This is Sir Vertigo, and I hope to see you next week.